Sunday with Fox 10's John Ho. You're not going to believe who we've got this week on Newsmaker Sunday. Arizona Senator John McCain. First time we've really been able to spend any uh, time with him since the election. Thank you for being here. Well, thanks, John. Thanks for having me on. Uh, and thanks for following the campaign. It well, was good to have you around. It was an odyssey that went back to 2000. We were mm -hmm. on the road with you then. We were on the road with you this time. It was quite amazing to I see. I promise you, you'll never be on the road <laughs> in a presidential campaign. I'll tell you, you got tougher to get close to as it went on. It got tougher and tougher and tougher. That's just the way it is. You get in a bubble, don't you? Yeah, and, uh, you know, the, the, we can rehash the campaign. I'll be glad to with you. But there is one fact, and that is that, uh, according to most polls, we were doing fine until the economy tanked. And, and I, I understand that. We dropped dramatically when the economy went down. Uh, but I, as I did uh, the night of the election, I give... President Obama, great credit for running a very effective and successful campaign. You know, we're going to talk about some of that, mm -hmm. but let me just quickly ask you before we move on, because people seeing your face on the screen and seeing you here in Arizona, they're going to want me to ask you, are you over it? Oh, sure. Yeah. I, I mean, heard you were over it in a month. Well, I was over it probably less than that. The key, I think the key to getting over any defeat in life is to get busy, get going, put it behind you. Uh, I've always enjoyed feeling sorry for myself, but I have not found it to be a very productive <laughs> enterprise. So after a short period of time, you just get back and get busy mm -hmm. and go forward. Exactly you know? what and you're I, doing. And that's what I've been doing. Let's, uh, let's talk about a couple of things that have happened that have broken in the news. David Souter, after 19 years appointed by the first Bush, he uh, announces he's retiring from the Supreme Court. At the time when he was selected, he was called a moderate conservative. You don't always know what you're going to get with these appointments. Warren Burger comes to mind. You never quite know, do you? No, you don't, because they're lifetime appointments. But you can get a pretty good indication by their record. And that, I think, was something that we didn't have uh, with Justice Souter. And, you know, it's interesting. You were talking about things that we don't expect, it was generally expected that Justice Stevens, who's very, uh, in his late 80s, I understand, and Justice Ginsburg, were going to be the next two vacancies. Now, right. it's Justice uh, Souter. And, l and let me just emphasize to you, elections have consequences. I think it's very clear that if I had been elected, I would have appointed a different individual than, than or nominated than uh, President Obama will. So elections have consequences. And second of all, I do believe that uh, this individual should have a record of very closely interpreting the Constitution of the United States. And when we have strayed from that, I think, is when the Supreme Court has gone into areas which I think have not been within their constitutional authority. You're talking about the quote-unquote activist judges. Yes, I certainly am. Um, you mentioned Ginsburg, 76, John Paul Stevens, 89. So you're going to get uh, potentially a turnover of three here in, in probably within Obama's term. It's, it would seem that's very the, likely. That's the conventional wisdom, yes. But the makeup of the court shouldn't change that much in terms of, of the split, right? I don't know. Because, as you say, you don't know how they will uh, perform or what will be the, the record. Uh, but um, still, I think you, there are some people who I've heard of who are under very active consideration that are a lot more liberal than Justices Ginsburg, Ginsburg and Stevens. But we'll have to see what happens here. Okay, uh, let's move on to Arlen Specter. We'll roll that video <laughs> tape. Wow. Uh, did you see this coming? First of all, Arlen Specter, for those of you uh, maybe not in the loop, and that's not a slight, um, you're busy out there, I understand that. This guy switched parties this week. From Republican to Democrat, he'd done it before, actually, when he ran for district attorney. Yeah, he switched from Democrat to Republican. He's done it before. He blasted Jim Jeffords seven years ago for doing the same thing and becoming an independent and voting with the Democrats. What does this say about what's going on in Washington? Well, frankly, it doesn't really say a lot. Uh, David Broder, a lot of our viewers don't know him, but he's a nationally syndicated column out of the Washington Post. One of the most respected centrist columnists in America wrote a column right after Senator Specter switched and titled Specter the Defector. 
Now, I think it's really not much more complicated than the fact that Senator Specter, by every indication, could not get reelected as a Republican to the Senate in the state of Pennsylvania. I don't think it was any more complicated than that. And so he chose a path of political expediency. And, I, and even he said it as much in so many words. Yeah, this, this brings up a point about cynicism about mm -hmm. Washington. Mm -hmm. That, you know, a lot of Americans think you guys are only thinking of self-preservation. That is it. And well, I can't, I can't, I can't argue okay. that with that inspector's case. Oh, okay, okay. Now, now the point being, and, and I was always and have always been a guy who never favored term limits because I've always mm -hmm. felt term limits were at the ballot box. Mm -hmm. I, I think of Central Arizona Project. Mm -hmm. If we didn't have seasoned guys in Congress, it never would have happened. Mm -hmm. But the point being is, you watch guys like Specter and people like this change just to keep their job. You do start to wonder, are they watching out for Americans, or are they simply out for themselves? Well, I think some are and some aren't. I think it's like, frankly, like talk show hosts. There are some that are... <laughs> <laughs> <Wait a minute. laughs> the, uh, look, I, I can point are to... Are you talking about term limiting? No, I, I, I could show you, for example, a, a senator like Senator Dick Luger of Indiana. You know, one of the most respected and influential members of the United States Senate. He's been there for a long, long time. There's nobody that believes that he's there just because he wants to be reelected. So there are individuals who put personal ambition over country, but there are others who do not. And I still think we probably should leave it to the to the good judgment of the voters as long as we have a relatively level playing field. Okay, let's, um, you know, as we mentioned at the outset, you're seeking a fifth term in the U.S. Senate. You are being challenged in your primary mm -hmm. by a guy named Chris Simcox. For people who may not know who he is, mm -hmm. he was a, one of the founding guys of the Minutemen. Mm -hmm. This is Chris Simcox announcing his candidacy. Could I just mention there's another candidate also, an individual that I believe his name is Deacons also. You're right. Yeah. Chris Simcox, this is uh, last week. Take a look. John McCain just seems to not have the steam that he used to have in this state. And many people are looking for an alternate conservative voice. What do you make of this and being challenged? At, uh, I take every race that I've been in very seriously. I take nothing for granted. I, I'm confident that the people of Arizona will understand the work that I've done for them and, and the work that, uh, that I can do for them in the future. Can we talk about the border issue for a moment? Because it would seem a guy like this is, is attacking what some would see as your Achilles heel, this issue of immigration. You go out and in your mind try to do the right thing to actually help mm -hmm. fix the problem. Mm -hmm. You get vilified by your own party. It hurts you in the presidential run. Your opponent uses it against you, Barack Obama, in Spanish language ads during the presidential campaign. You got beat up actually trying to fix the problem. Well, can you, first can of all, you articulate? Me, well, well, first of all, let me respectfully uh, add to, to your point. I won the primary in Florida because of the Hispanic vote. I won primaries because of Republican Hispanic voters. So I may not have been the nominee of the party if I hadn't have been able to get Hispanic votes. And also it's very clear that the Republican Party, particularly in our part of the country, Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, other states, California, that we're going to have to recruit and elect Hispanics to office so that we can broaden the Republican Party and, and win elections. So. Uh, look, the violence on the border is very serious. We just had a hearing chaired by Senator Lieberman of the Homeland Security Committee. We had another one in Washington where Janet Napolitano and others testified. This drug cartel problem is an existential threat to the government of Mexico. And that violence is going to spill over. We must secure our borders. It's not any more complicated than And that. I remember during the campaign you said, you know, I hear you to the voters. When, when you were trying to help fix this problem, you said, I hear you and I, I understand that we've got to secure the border first and then we can address these other problems. But in short, just articulate what you think should happen with this well, we illegal should. immigration we issue. Should. Because we people should. were saying, McCain wants amnesty, McCain wants this and that. What do you want? I want us to secure, secure the borders. As I said, we not only uh, have uh, problems with human smuggling, but we also have...